Are the issues surrounding the World Cup a specifically Qatari or also a global problem? Are the annual COP summits making a meaningful contribution to efforts to address the climate emergency? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Wain Rabbani, and for this episode of Connections, we're delighted to be speaking with Lale Khalidi. Lale Khalidi is a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University in London. Her most recent book is Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. She's currently working on a project on the everyday entanglements of hydrocarbons in our lives. Lale Khalili, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, well, perhaps we should um, uh, jump right in and uh, first address the issue that now has the undivided attention of most of the globe, which is the FIFA World Cup in uh, Qatar. And of course, um, you're familiar with um, uh, many of the criticisms that have been made of Qatar, um, not only in terms of its human rights record, but also specifically about its um, uh, horrible treatment of migrant workers. And, and that seems to have emerged as, as the crux of the um, objections um, to this particular event. And as, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, should we see this solely as a Qatari problem or is it also a symptom of a much broader uh, global problem with the um, integration of global labor markets and, and uh, other issues that you, of course, have been looking at very carefully in recent years. Okay, so let me start by saying that actually there are three issues. Um, one that the Europeans focused on, which is the question of gay rights in Qatar. When, uh, and of course, we know that this um, is a longstanding issue in a uh, lot of countries of the world where um, you have homophobic um, uh, essentially policies that really truly constrict the ways in which people live and behave. But we also know that this becomes this uh, sort of a, um, uh, homo-nationalism in Jasper Poir's wonderful terminology, ends up also becoming a platform through which some European uh, and North American gay right activists, um, as well as Israeli pink washers, um, uh, essentially use it as a way to sort of um, uh, both uh, advance their own personal platforms. Peter Thatchell in the UK is one very prominent uh, figure in this, but also, as I said, uh, uh, you know, to pink wash countries like Israel. And so you, you have this issue and then you have all of the Germans who um, or uh, and on all of the European teams that have worn a little um, rainbow flag on their um, sleeves, which, of course, it's a kind of a performance that um, rings a little bit hollow, given the extent to which uh, the, the sort of homophobia actually is a uh, deep characteristic, not only in, you know, in uh, Middle Eastern countries. And there's no doubt that there's huge amounts of homophobia we know of people like Sarah Higazi, for example, in Egypt, who ended up being uh, persecuted and prosecuted for suicide. flying and, and committed suicide for flying a rainbow flag. So we know these are real issues, but I think that in uh, a lot of the criticism is being done in bad faith. I also well, think, well, if, I, if I may, know, you also, you know, you, you discussed um, uh, posturing and performing, and people have also noted that these European teams who got all high and mighty about combating homophobia caved at the first sign of yes. punishment by the organizers, yeah. while in, in sharp contrast, the Iranian team, um, at great risk to themselves uh, in their first game, refused to sing the Iranian national anthem. Yeah. And I think it's it's also for me quite interesting. I live in the area where the Arsenal football team uh, operates. My son is a huge Arsenal fan. And I know that Arsenal has gone out of its way to be an inclusive team, uh, both in around questions of race and class, but also particularly around questions of uh, gender and sexual rights. And I and, and what I mean by that is that they, they actually do encourage um, these forms. Uh, 
but it is also this is also a commercial decision and as you point out of course they caved in at the first sign that this could potentially endanger them in any way at all and fifa is is not really the arbitrator on this fifa is one of the most corrupt inst- international institutions you can possibly work with and they oh, are and completely and totally self serving yes and precisely because of that we're now discussing a world cup in qatar many people. exactly so there's that Okay, number one. Uh, and as I said, this the, the debate around the question of sort of the ways in which uh, uh, the people engaged in same-sex marriage or identifying as being gay um, have been at the crux of so much of the politics that surrounds Middle East. And so, so you you know you you have people who argue this in good faith uh, uh, against homophobia, and then they have vastly more phalanxes of people who don't do so. And so I think, you know, the, the, the kind of bad faith arguments is something that Joseph Massad, for example, wrote about about 20 years ago. But there is something to be said about the fact that there is also indigenous uh, debates around questions, you know, anti-homophobic um, pro-sexual rights. Ignored, are they not? They are being ignored. They are indigenous movements around this. And there's actually quite a lot of contention among them. So when Peter Thatchell did his kind of a ridiculous performance in Qatar a few weeks ago, just before the World Cup started, there was actually quite intense debate in Arab queer circles, both online and offline, around whether or not this was a useful act or not. And although the vast majority of the uh, uh, online out queer Arabs thought that this was quite a kind of a uh, cynical and self-serving performance, there were actually people in Qatar who anonymously said that they were happy about it. So the debate is not settled. It's just that I don't think that the bad faith, self-serving kind of pink washing type uh, people from the West do us any favors by kind of sticking their noses in. So that's the first thing. The second thing is a lot more contentious uh, in some ways. And I think that in in some ways, it's also, to me, a little bit more clear cut. So um, it uh, uh, we know that uh, migrant labor uh, is uh, deployed in a lot of the Arab world, but also elsewhere in the world. Um, and the, the kafala system that c- controls them, which essentially limits the ways in which they move, um, and also uh, the, the sort of the gradation of the kinds of contracts that people receive. So you have uh, people that are con- considered to be Sorry, menial uh, workers. But just to clarify uh, for our viewers, a kafala system is um, a situation whereby a migrant worker is explicitly tied to a single employer and, and residency and employment rights are governed um, uh, by the relationship with that single employer, correct? Yes, absolutely. That is correct. I think more importantly, in a very kind of a banal way, pa- people's passports are taken off of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that it, that ties them to the employer. That mm-hmm. it physically removes the possibility of them escaping. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are uh, somewhat less kind of punitive equivalents of this uh, exist in the global north as well. We we know, for example, that when Elon Musk went and fired uh, I don't know, hundreds of people from Twitter and then sent out a message saying you're going to have to, if you want to stay, you're going to have to work over time and, uh, you know, essentially work outside of the strictures of labor rights um, and then posted pictures of it. And it, uh, uh, many people have said, and including people who used to be Twitter employees, that many of those people that were in the photographs were H1, uh, on HB, uh, H1B. H1B. Yes, H one B visas, which is kind and and with an H one B visa, unless you can find another employer in sixty days, you then you have right to residency. You do lose your residencies. It's a kafala system in a way. Mm-hmm. It is more permissive. Your passport is not taken off of you. You have sixty days. It's not immediate. But it, nevertheless, it, it it is a system where immigration uh, is is used. Uh, the, the the sort of the restrictions around the border is used to create a docile working class. Now we know that this system is rampant throughout the Gulf. In fact, it is one of the ways in which the Gulf uh, Emirates and kingdoms and sultanates maintain themselves. It is, you know, the, in the vast majority of the countries of the Arabian Peninsula, I think the only two exceptions um, being uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, immigrants are uh, 
you know, the majority of the population, maybe Oman is uh, at 50-50, Bahrain is also at 50-50, but in all of these other places, um, in Qatar, for example, the, the uh, population of the country is about 3 million. Out of that 3 million, 100,000 are only Qatari citizens, and, or 300,000. And, uh, and, and a clear majority of these um, uh, migrants are, I believe, South Asians um, and also from East Asia, no? Yes. So uh, South Asian, and, and what is also interesting is that the jobs are racialized, right? Mm -hmm. So you are going to have uh, European expats in, manage in managerial positions. You will also now increasing, increasingly have South Asian and Southeast Asian middle class managers also in positions of power. But then you have particular nationalities that populate other jobs, including, for example, construction workers or uh, the, the sort of the cleaning staff or, or the kinds of um, uh, uh, blue collar, if you will, or manual labor um, skilled. Actually, in many instances, these people are skilled. I don't want to say low paying or uh, non-skilled jobs, but they, they just have uh, the skills that are not acknowledged or recognized, certainly by pay. And so there's large numbers of them. And now one of the things about this, about the, these large phalanxes of um, migrant workers in places like uh, the United Arab Emirates or in Qatar or in Kuwait or indeed even in Saudi Arabia is that they take on jobs um, where uh, they, they are sending money home. Uh, they are under the kafala strictures. And even though Qatar made some noises about removing some of these legal strictures in the run up to uh, the World Cup and because of in external pressure, uh, it really hasn't changed. And they are exploited. And if they try to, they, they obviously don't have the right to unionize Sorry in none it. of when, these when countries. When you say um, exploited, is the exploitation being performed directly by the governments, in this case by Qatar, or is it a case of the government basically giving a free hand to employment agencies and businesses and contractors to do as they please with these? Workers? That's a very good question. I mean, the fact is that in many of these countries, many of the businesses, and, the, and this is actually even more so the case in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, where a lot of the private businesses are private just so far because they are actually the, the ruling families have massive investments in those and, and, and benefit directly from it. The same is actually also true in Saudi Arabia, where many Many of the companies that are ostensibly private or have private branches have actually direct connections to whoever's in power and, and sort of, you know, he's their patron, whoever is sitting at the at the apex at the moment, that being Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. Um, so in many of these cases, these are private companies. The government regulations facilitate those forms of exploitation because, for example, the, kafa the rules around kafala, but also because of the various kinds of um, uh, the regulations are so lax. So, uh, for example, uh, if you're working outside, all of these, most of these countries have a regulation that you're not supposed to um, sort of work beyond 50 degrees work once the temperature reaches 50 degrees centigrade and of course it never exceeds 49 it never exceeds 49 and so the official temperature that is published in whatever you can see it says 49 whereas if you're in a taxi and the taxi actually does have the temperature outside you'll see like sometimes it could be 52 53 degrees and so in those ways the the, the governments are implicated very directly so um that's one of the factors in there that is really important now what is also significant is that met the, the countries which send many of these workers are deeply dependent on the remittances from these um from from these migrant workers so they turn a blind eye to these abuses as well they do um one of the things that i discovered when i was doing my research was that i contacted all the labor attaches of um india pakistan and bangladesh in all of those countries where i was doing research asking for if they had any statistics for like for example bodies repatriated back home uh, of migrant workers and how they had died or any sort of statistics on the number of people who had sought consular support because of um injury or because of abandonment or because of non-payment of wages, because obviously that is what they're supposed to do, right? I got no response. Nobody would talk to me about this. It's it's it, it 
Do, they will not do anything to anger the governments in uh, the, these Gulf countries, because as I said, their economies are profoundly dependent on those remittances, um, not only in, in a sort of a, as, as part of their GDP, but also because many of these uh, wage workers that are working in the countries of the Gulf and are sending income home are essentially removing the necessity of the state, for example, supporting families that might be in debt or supporting families that might have issues with um, health care or whatever. So these, these remittances are at some level uh, also replacements for provision of welfare in the sending countries. Okay, so we've got all of these conditions. Then what emerges around this are a series mm -hmm. of arguments, both from the outside and both from the inside. Now, from the outside, they're both good faith arguments and bad faith arguments. It is absolutely not surprising that activists that organize around labor issues would use of the moment of a, an international event to put pressure on these countries. It is completely to be understood. There's nothing cynical about those labor activists doing this, right? So in, there is actually good faith external activism around questions of labor, which uses these moments as moments of leverage. And, and your it, argument here is that they have a consistent agenda, whether at home or abroad. They, and they need, to, and, and those labor activists do. And, and some of these labor activist organizations are coming out of places like, for example, the Philippines, which is one of these big countries where the activist organizations are butting against not only the countries where migrants end up, but also their own, because of course the Philippines government is uh, is the one country in the world which has the highest percentage of its GDP coming from remittances, right? So, so these activist organizations, we have to recognize that not all of them are European. They're actually activist organizations from other parts of the world that are saying, this is a moment in which we can use the leverage of an international event to put pressure on these governments. And the, and the kinds of mild, uh, gestures that the Qatari government has made in terms of regulations, which have never been implemented, has been in response to these external pressure. But there's also quite a lot of bad faith. You know, they they tried working on the sort of the pink washing uh, thing, uh, but Peter Thatchell's kind of self serving well, performances are well known, and so. I I was about to ask, has the EU's Frontex uh, made an issue out of the treatment of uh, migrant workers in Qatar? No, of course not. Mm. Of course not. I mean, it's you're not going to find these kinds of debates emerging out of the countries in which, uh, you know, the, 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 the protection of fortress Europe or the protection of fortress America, you know, the, the, the sort of the boundaries at the south is precisely intended to create migrant workers that are not supported. The illegality provides essentially a weapon which allows for these workers to be docile. I don't like the whataboutery. I, uh, there is there is that the, there are no protections really for those migrant workers in Qatar. So I think it is important to acknowledge that short of these kinds of forms of pressure from places because they can be shipped home, you know, immediately they can be deported. Um, so so there is there is an element of bad faith argument coming out of countries in Europe where they also sort of limit, uh, they create the conditions for uh, sort of. Uh, exploited migrant communities, um, and, and those are cynical. What I also have a problem with are culturalist arguments that are being made by some Twitter Arabs. And I haven't really actually run into this among my circle of friends, but it's one of those things where it bumps in front of you, where, you know, the, the culturalist arguments are, you know, this is our culture, we don't have homosexuality in our culture, which if anybody actually knows anywhere in the world, you, you know, that's kind of bullshit and ridiculous. Or, for example, the kinds of culturalist arguments. Well, this is our culture of work. And yes, we don't have the regulations, but we treat them like guests, which is also completely and totally bullshit, as we all know it. And so in some ways, you also there is a huge amount of bad faith arguments swirling around this. And I think that on, has on to be acknowledged. Back and forth. The other problem is that, of course, we don't. This is also another thing. A huge, a lot of different statistics are being bandied about, about how many people have died in the construction of these um, of these stadia. And we know that people have died, right? But I would challenge any of the people that are the, the sort of the bad faith cynics to name for me anyone except for one English guy who died 
in, in the construction of, uh, I think, Le Sale in 2012. I don't even know his name, but I know there was one English guy who died. So a white guy dies and people know his name. But they don't know the names of all of those others, in part because that information is uh, its like in a vault. You can't get to it. The, the sending countries won't reveal that. Uh, and Qatar won't reveal that. There so are different ways one, of counting it. Yes, I, I was about to ask, um, how does one um, uh, get an accurate or at least a reasonable. Figure. I mean, there are but some estimates that are being made, and those estimates are being made on the basis of, for example, excess deaths, or, uh, for example, on the kinds of um, information that some of ILO or you know some of these other um, uh, sort of international organizations have ways of knowing these numbers, which they provide in a kind of an estimate form, and so we really don't have access to good statistics on this information. And again, that is by design. The Qataris don't want it, and nor do the sending countries. They don't want that information to come out. And so, in, again, this is it, what you see is uh, that who is being lost in, in, in this equation are the workers themselves. Now, I want to use this moment to actually pitch an amazing book, which if anybody is actually interested in the question of migrant labor, this book by Natasha Iskandar, uh, it, it called uh, Does Skill Make Us Human? is precisely about migrant workers in Qatar. Um, and that quite the, the amazing Amazingly poignant title comes from a basic question that is it being skilled that will give us the kinds of rights that we need in order to be migrant workers? Mm. And of course, does that make us human? And so if we are supposedly not unskilled, and again, I have a lot of issues with the terminology of unskilled, um, then you know, then uh you know what's going to be that that is quite a huge uh you know, it is it is a factor. People that are called unskilled are unprotected in these cases. And, and, sp and speaking of these workers, we've we've discussed governments, we've discussed activists. Are there, um, uh, do we have a picture of whether these migrant workers themselves, who of course are deprived of unionization rights, have they sought to organize to uh, protect and defend their own interests? And if so, um, uh, how how have they fared? So they haven't fared very well. Uh, unfortunately, the, the way that the systems have, set, have been set up is that um, in, in the countries of the Gulf, um, Oman has some mild uh, permissions for unions to emerge, which has recently emerged, but they're very state affiliated. Um, Bahrain and Qatar set up unions sometime in the 1950s and the 1960s. And by design, they were designed in such a way to exclude workers for private firms, which left out the oil companies and also migrant workers. And there is, in my book, I actually write about this. Um, in the case of the Kuwaiti um, uh, effort to set up the unions, um, when they were trying to do so, when the, when the working uh, folks there were trying to do so, the British and the Americans intervened and said, no, it, it, it needs to exclude migrant workers. And interestingly, one of the arguments that the... Uh, Kuwaiti labor activists made was that if you excluded migrant workers, you would set up an apartheid system. They literally used the term apartheid. Um, and sure enough, they are right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was in the 1960s. So what we find now is that every time that there is a kind of an um, mobilization by workers, and we've seen, for example, mobilization but by Uber drivers or delivery drivers, we've seen mobilization by construction workers. We've seen in many instances, these people are just um, arrested and shipped out. In the case of Qatar, uh, a, a, uh, an organizer who was Kenyan was thrown in prison because his, uh, because his attempts at union organization was seen to be sort of endangering the security of the state. So securitization of labor organization is one of the ways in which the countries of the Gulf control um, sort of the, 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 the situation. So I think that I, I think this is something that needs to be acknowledged and recognized. Now, there are ways in which people have found ways of working around this. Um, another scholar I'd like to actually you know, talk about here is, yeah. uh, is, is a guy by the name of Alex Budrukas, who wrote a really fascinating piece for Middle East Report. And you could look him up in uh, Middle East Report about the sort of workarounds that some of these organizations have found. And one of them was that migrants rights organizations in the Philippines were making deals with Kuwaiti unions 
so so the so the rights of Filipino workers in um in right. the in Kuwait were protected by these unions back in Philippines, but they were done so through these kinds of uh, um, uh, alliances, if you will, or treaties between the unions. And it's a very creative way that allows for them to function in this way, sort of find the workaround. And I think that 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 those kinds of transnational forms of solidarity really do need to emerge in in some ways in order to allow for these kinds of changes. Changes. I also want to mention that there is also a third thing that very, we haven't seen very much of it, a third controversy around the uh, around the World, World Cup. Cup. And I think this will allow, uh, sorry, um, yeah, that this will allow us to also make our way into COP, to segue into COP. And that is that Qatar has claimed that this is a carbon That's neutral zero. World Cup, which is bullshit. Sorry, I have to yell that. It's hilarious. Claims of carbon neutrality, anywhere that you see them, for any kind of a big corporation, you have to take it not with a grain of salt, but with a barrel of salt, okay? And in this case, the way that uh, Qatar can claim that importing huge amounts of construction material, using enormous amounts of energy to construct these, using air conditioning to God knows how much, or using um, massive uh, sort of extra desalination in order for people to have water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only way that this can be carbon neutral is through some kind of a chicanery, like, for example, buying carbon credits. And buying carbon credits, as anybody who does research in the really dependable research sort of resources like Financial Times, you'll find that carbon credits are a ruse. They are essentially what some very rich uh, polluters pay some poor countries that do not produce just to buy those credits off of them or to plant trees in such and such place. Um, and then the trees die. So you, so you can claim carbon credits or you can claim carbon neutrality, but actually it means nothing. And I think I've seen a lot less attention paid to that. And so I wanted to be, bring that up and use that as a segue into our discussion right. and, of and, COP27. It is a great segue, but before moving on, I do want to ask you just about one additional aspect of the World Cup. And yeah. that is um, uh, the regular Morocco. presence of the Palestinian flag. Yeah. And um, uh, again, here you have some people looking at this and, and saying it's a very inspiring show of support by teams and their fans. And then you have um, others without taking anything away from uh, the brutal Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. Again, what about a yeah. And now you even have apparently a left leaning German newspaper saying the fact it's anti Semitic is that the fact that the Moroccan team raised the Palestinian flag is proof that these They're players anti are anti Semites. Yeah. So I think actually one of the things that people. Oh, sorry. I, and I also wanted to ask you about this also in the context of, of what you referred to as transnational solidarity. I think that it's I think it's really important to mention that a large number of the Moroccan players are actually born in country born and raised in the countries of Europe. And so they're not doing this because they're Arab anti-Semites or that there's some sort of a cultural blah, blah, but precisely because they have a profound experience of the moment that you open your mouth in support of Palestinians, you could potentially be accosted with that accusation of anti-Semitism regardless of whatever, particularly in places like Germany or Belgium or France where a lot of, or Spain, where a lot of these Moroccan um, players were, you know, were born and raised. And so I think flying the Palestinian flag is a form of, um, uh, pan-Arab solidarity. It's also really important for me to mention that, of course, yes, Morocco, definitely the, the Sahrawi, the, the, the suppression of the Sahrawi movement uh, and, and the uh, the violence with which sort of, uh, you know, counterinsurgency is deployed. And in fact, the break, you know, the, the, they have broken treaties very recently. It's, it's quite an important thing. And we do need to acknowledge that. But I also think it's really important to remember that the team does not necessarily represent the state, um, as, as neither do really the European teams, because if you look at the European teams, those European teams don't represent the racist uh, states of, you know, the, the racist governments in uh, the Netherlands or in uh, the UK or in France. The, the, the teams there are some of the most diverse. In the case of England, I can say some of the most decent, incredibly lovely young men um, who have been abused in their own countries. So I think in the case also 
of the Moroccan uh, team flying the flag. I think they're doing that out of a sentiment, out of a pan-Arab sentiment. In fact, if anything, I think it's also a rebuke to their own governments, because I think that with all of Morocco the- Morocco being a prominent uh, um, example of a state that normalized relations- Completely. During the Trump years. Absolutely. And so in a way, this is also intended to say that our states, uh, the Arab states or the, the Arab players are saying that these states might be making uh, nice with the, with the Israeli government at the very moment in which the Israeli government now is completely, totally open fascists, you know, sitting, sitting um, in the Knesset and in the in their in their the ministries yeah. and in the cabinet. Um, at that very moment, I think that the, the Moroccans are trying to actually show solidarity with the Palestinian people. And I think that it is it is an, a, a popular shabby Arab sentiment rather than one that has to do with a Nasserite notion of state led uh, pan-Arabism. Well, particularly if one considers that um, Morocco normalized relations with Israel and its occupation and in exchange received American recognition of its illegal annexation of, of. Um, uh, Western Sahara and now increasing yes. the European support for that uh, position as well. But um, let's return uh, to net zero and, and your segue. <laughs> you were actually in Sharm el Sheikh um, uh, recently where the COP27 um, uh, summit was convened. Can I just begin by asking, um, how did you end up there? So, so it came as a complete surprise. Sometime in uh, September, an email went around Queen Mary um, saying we have these few spaces to go to Sharm el Sheikh. What you know, you can apply to go to COP twenty seven because we have had a number of really amazing colleagues who work on questions of public health, for example, and indigenous rights that have you know that went to um, to COP twenty six in Glasgow in in the UK, um, and so they they had managed to sort of secure a few more spaces. And, you know, that everybody at Queen Mary was given a chance if they wanted to, to apply for a post. And I actually have to say, I, I'm, I'm working on a book about oil right now. And I thought, OK, I'll do this. I, I actually right didn't in. think. Mm. Yeah. And, and sure enough. Uh, because because of the subject that I'm working on, questions of um, the way that oil is sort of entangled in 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 areas of our lives that we don't necessarily think about, what which are crucially important: financialization, um, transportation, health and safety, um, sort of scientific exploration, etc. Um, I I really wanted to see COP. 27 in action because I wanted to see how there was a response being made, being given to to sort of the complete and total way in which um, oil seems to just sort of interpenetrate every bits of our lives. And I was utterly surprised to be selected to go. And so well, I went for, yeah. Yeah, I was, was going to say, on, 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 on that note, you, you wrote a wonderful piece um, in the London Review of Books about uh, about your um, visit to uh, Sharm el Sheikh, but perhaps you could give us an indication, particularly given your current research. Um, to what extent did you feel there is a serious attempt to address the whole issue of hydrocarbons and um, uh, their role in producing the climate emergency? Or rather, was this kind of um, providing the hydrocarbon lobby and involved governments and so on with an alibi of, well, we came here, uh, you know, um, we came, we saw, mm. and we produced for the international market. So I think that there, um, it, there are really I, I, at least three parallel tracks mm -hmm. uh, that are going on. And sometimes these tracks don't meet at all. The first track is like the ministerial meetings. And I do think that there it's there's a massive division between the countries which are polluting countries. And those include countries of the global north where um, per capita production is, uh, you know, per capita production of pollution and of carbon um, is, is, you know, just at the highest. And it's China where the absolute production of uh of carbon is the highest in the world. Um, and of course, you know, the, the oil producing nations, particularly of the Gulf, um, who 
on the, on one side and then you have all of the other countries and they're like island countries that are going to go underwater or um or countries where their forests are being devastated or countries where they're you know a sort of desert desertification is happening at fast rates um floods pakistan bangladesh of course we know have been underwater you know a third of pakistan when you think about that is just it's crazy Anyway, so um, so you have all, you have these different states and minister and their representatives are actually battling, and in fact, it went on for a couple of days after in order to recognize. Um, uh, number one, that 1.5 degrees should be the limit, which uh, unfortunately they did not reach any re uh, any agreements on the implementation of the 1.5 degrees. And then the second thing that they were trying to work on was they're coming to an agreement over what is called loss and damage, which is yes. about uh, pet re reparations to countries which are affected. So the island countries, for example, which lose their coastal areas or more frequent hurricanes or flooding or whatever. Um, the the uh, loss and damage, they arrived at some sort of a formula, but actually they punted this to the next year, where also irony of ironies, COP28 is being Abu held Dhabi. in the in Abu Dhabi, which is like one of the biggest producers of oil in the world. Anyway, um, so... So, uh, so it's actually being held, I think, in Dubai. I think they're using the Dubai see. Expo, but but Abu Dhabi obviously is part of the United Arab Emirates. Anyway, so that's the first first track. There's a second track of um, activists um, uh, and the and, and NGOs, and there's a whole range of different kinds of groups in there because you but have. We've, we've often heard that the Egyptian government worked very hard to keep these people out of uh, Sharm el Sheikh, particularly Egyptian. Yes. Um, activists. So you, so you have, you know, UN workers, which is like, you know, of course, they completely co-opt other cases. They they co-opt other causes. They are quite reformist. They're quite conciliatory, etc. Then you move on down, and you get indigenous groups are being represented from different parts who are going around and meeting. And given that this was in, um, uh, this was considered to be the African COP. Uh, it was held in Congo some years back, but this was also in uh, in a country which which has uh, laxer visa regimes than, for example, Europe or North America. And so actually there were a huge number of African delegates there. And, and I think that this was important for these African delegates, civil society activists, whatever, regardless of how reformist or revolutionary they might be, to meet each other and to sort of make connections. I think it was an interesting moment for that. So um, in the case of Egypt, Egypt, of course, kept out um, climate activists, human rights activists and many and, and refused to um, refuse to credential them. And so many of them got credentials through um, international organizations that um, that actually were able to give them credentials to be present there. So Amnesty International or United Nations, or in some cases, like, for example, German NGOs that provided some support for activists. And so the presence actually of these um, activists and foremost among them, actually the family of Allah Abdul Fattah, was really this, important. This is a prominent Egyptian Abdel prisoner is in, who was on uh, hunger, has been on, or had been on hunger. Had been on hunger strike, strike and was forcibly fed and watered during the during the the conference. And his family, his the women in his family, have been extraordinary activists in trying to get his fate and the fate of other um, uh, political prisoners in Egypt in front of the world. Because of course, you know, the states cannot be relied on to do anything for them. I mean, um, Al Abdel Fattah is a uh, British citizen. Rishi Sunak did nothing to get him out of there. Um, you know, the commerce, um, whatever his, he is, a business guy um, from Britain was there. When people approached him, he's, he was just very non-committal. And so I think that there's this kind of a cheesy, incredibly kind of self-serving, again, bad faith, uh, we are doing everything we can, thoughts and prayers type arguments coming from the government. And so it was amazing that the activists were actually able to get this in front of people. And one of the things that I said in, in my piece is that perhaps the most moving and the only heartening thing that came out of there, other than loss and damage, was that, uh, in fact, when the People's Assembly happened in the penultimate day of the conference, uh, you know, people were saying, we have not yet been defeated. And I think that that hope in this moment of utter doom is actually really important. And, and this also reflects the title of 
uh, book. Al Abdul Fattah's book. Fattah. Yes, and I think that that's amazing. Mm -hmm. There was a third parallel track, and that's the one that I went to observe, and it turned out to be the thing that maybe because I was just hanging out in all of these business uh, type things, the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Chamber of Shipping, uh, the net zero business community, this and that. And it's and it was horrific because this is because you realize that there is an entire parallel happening and there's a lot of conversation going on between these businesses and the ministers and there are deals being made also bilaterally between the ministers and the presence of the businesses there are cynical um, and 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 also quite kind of undermining. Um, some activist group actually got a list of all the delegates and they counted them. And it seems like there were 636 representatives from the oil industry there. Among them, the CEO of um, BP that went there as a delegate of Mauritania to sign a deal with Mauritania to explore for oil and gas. There were so you're, all sorts suggesting, of you're suggesting that, that more deals were assigned to increase hydrocarbon production um, yes. than to uh, than to confront climate change. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, some of them also talk about, oh, let's do hydrogen. And that's supposed to be an alternative fuel. But of course, hydrogen is just a mask for natural gas. So it is all hydrocarbons, right? But in addition to the oil people, some of the other people that were there were like, um, agroforestry people. So essentially, the, the people who are cutting down all the forests. And and cattle, the cattle lobby was there. And so it's kind of, you know, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE have two of the biggest pavilions. And it's kind of like, you know, and Qatar, we, let's not forget Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the UAE had three of the biggest pavilions in the in the sort of the biggest hall. And so you look at that and you you really do kind of despair at, at, at the, the this type of you know, uh, this type well, you of conference. You mentioned despair, but is, is a conclusion um, that these summits actually um, do more harm than good? No, uh, I don't think so. And I think in part, not because of what comes out of them, but because of the occasion that they produce for people to get together. And I do think that this is one of those moments where there is, uh, I, I, I think at the moment, the balance is that there's more good being done than, than bad. But who knows? I mean, this, is, this keeps going and it's, it becomes like punting things into the long grass and this becomes an alibi. Um, I, think, I, I think I'd need to see more. I think the, the, the agreement, for, for example, for loss and damage was quite good. But the fact is that the 1.5 degree, which was agreed to in Paris about six years ago, there's no implementation being made towards and, and it. That's and that's the key issue now for Yeah, the it is. Yeah. It is. And so, you know, carbon capture and all these sort of fantasies that there's going to be some sort of a technological solution to, to what is essentially a problem of overconsumption. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think I, 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 it's hard for me to, to be catastrophist, but I do... Um, and, and so I'm trying to find the positives around this. And I think one of the positives around this was the, was, was the fact that there were all these connections being made. And um, on, on that note, um, you just recently published a lengthy and wonderful piece, also the London Review of Books, on the consulting industry. Yeah. And given the two issues that we've discussed, the World Cup and um, COP27, I was curious if you could perhaps briefly indicate are, are consulting firms kind of the oil that lubricate these <laughs> issues that, uh, that we've been uh, discussing? Okay, so so the LRB piece is a review of a wonderful book called When McKinsey Comes to Town by two right. guys who are, um, and I have to again acknowledge, pitch it. It's a very good book, um, uh, and, and I would recommend it extremely highly. They're both investigative journalists with um, New York Times, and their names are Michael Forsyth and uh, Walt Bogdanich. Um, so When McKinsey Comes to Town is this incredibly detailed book about the way that McKinsey has kind of, uh, or as, as a sort of the example that they're focusing on this very high powered, extremely, you know, posh suit, um, extremely embedded in governments, um, a consulting firm that goes in and, and creates opportunities essentially for businesses. And my argument in my LRB piece is that this, what they do is they, um, they claim to be sort of, you know, the, the evangelizing the Bible of capital and private markets and, 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 businesses but in fact their biggest and most lucrative uh deals come Our from public monies 
is public money, is taxpayer money from the US, um, from the UK, from everywhere they go, Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. I spend this section, for example, talking about the way that uh, McKinsey and BCG, Boston Consulting Group, actually um, were completely and totally you know, implicated, not only in you know bullshit fantasy money-making ventures like Vision the plan for NEOM yeah. or Vision 2030, but more importantly, in doing very dirty work. So in the US, for example, McKenzie was involved in advising ICE and one of the, the uh, immigration control uh, people. And one of the things that it suggested to them was that one money saving thing that they could do was to cut the amounts of food and medicine going to the immigrants. Now, actually, the people that worked for ICE were like, we can't do this. I mean, if you can believe that people are working for immigration, the cops, the immigration cops, Objected. Are, McKenzie, yeah. we can't do this. I mean, okay. Tells you all you need to know. It really does. In Saudi Arabia, they produced a report which gauged public reactions, usually via Twitter, to Mohammed bin Salman's activities. And among this, they provided profiles with pictures of dissidents who immediately upon the publication of the thing, either them or their families are arrested. One of those dissidents was actually a friend of uh, Gamal Khashoggi, um, and and his phone was infected with Pegasus, which is the Saudi... Uh, Israeli which is a, spyware. Yeah. Israeli sp- spyware that the Arab countries love to buy and install on every, uh, you know, and on phones of dissidents, and and there is some thought that that the way that Khashoggi was targeted was precisely because Pegasus was on this other dissident who was in Canada and on his phone, and so and McKinsey actually provided the names of these people. I mean, it is kind of horrific when you think about this. Now, th- these are like some of the worst things that they do, but the basic things that they do, some you know, that essentially essentially is about cost cutting and it's about removing labor in one form or another. And I think that the, that, and, and, uh, and they do so through either automation or through reorganization. And anybody who has been in a university or in a government department knows that reorganizations are as, uh, is a way that management keeps themselves relevant, gives themselves um, plausible deniability, keeps the workers constantly unstable. And in a sense, in, a, in, a, in, in uncertainty, um, and it's it's a form of labor discipline. You've got it's Catholicism. management imposing austerity on on the workforce using uh, public using public management public. consultants. Yes. But it's not even when it's not austerity. That uncertainty is a form of labor discipline. If you right. don't know whether you've got your job or not, maybe you will be much more uh, docile. And I think that this is enormously significant. And McKinsey and other management consultants. It's not just McKinsey. Boston Consulting Group does that. Booz Allen does that. Um, there's loads of them. They all they're all implicated. Mm. Lali Khalili, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and insights with uh, Connections. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Marin. It's always lovely to see you. And it was my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.